This is Psych Boost, helping you with your psychology qualification, one video at a time. The very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. A very big thank you for your help, guys. To join them, follow this link. For everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. So, I imagine you're here to study GCSE psychology. So here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. As we go through the video, they'll be in red text. You need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. This diagram is called the multi-store model. You're going to want to remember this diagram inside and out. So when I finish talking you through it, pause the video and draw it on some scrap paper until you can do it from memory. It was created back in 1968 by Atkinson and Schifrin, two cognitive psychologists. They use this model to describe how information is processed in your mind. They identified three memory stores, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. So let's talk about the process quickly. You take in a massive amount of sensory information every single second. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smells. That all enters into your brain, but you don't pay attention to most of it, and it's just lost. What you do pay attention to is passed to the next memory store, short-term memory. There it's held on to, but not for long. That information is either lost or it's processed and then passed to long-term memory. That processing is called rehearsal, and there are two types. Maintenance, so you might repeat a name again and again and again to learn it or elaborative. This is when you think about the meaning of what you're trying to remember. You may think how that new fact you just learned in class is linked to other things that you know. Now information is in long-term memory. Now it can be lost, but if we want to use the information in long-term memory, we need to be able to bring it back into short-term memory. That's called retrieval. Now, what we need to know about these free stores are features. So we might be able to ask about how the information is coded so uh, what form the information is, the capacity, so how much the store can hold, and the duration, so how long that store can hold information. Starting with the sensory register. Well, the information comes directly from the senses, and the way that information is stored depends on the sense. We would call that kind of coding modality specific. Capacity is very large. It has to take in all the information from all the senses. But the duration, how long that information is held, is very short. It can be around 250 milliseconds. Moving to the short-term memory store. The coding is acoustic, so an inner voice. The capacity, so the number of items you can hold, seems to be very small. It's around seven items. So with some variability, some people can remember a little more, or a little less. We say seven items plus or minus two. How long you can hold that information onto is very short, around about 18 seconds. Anything not passed to long-term memory by then or repeated with your inner voice is lost. So talking of long-term memory, its coding is semantic. So information in the form of meaning. Both the capacity and the duration appears to be unlimited. And we can see this with older people being able to recall lots of information about their lives, even from their earliest years. So let's consider some evaluations of the multi-store model. There is a significant amount of evidence that the stores are separate. For example, the case study of Clive Waring. He only has a short-term memory and no long-term memory. This suggests that the two stores are separate. And each store has been investigated for its features. The seven plus or minus two figure was from a researcher called Miller. However, we can criticize the multi-store model. It is too simplistic. Long-term memory isn't just one store. There are three types. Short-term memory also seems to be too simplistic and researchers now use the working memory model to explain how we process both auditory and visual information in our short-term memory. An effect that we need to understand in memory is something called the serial position effect. Here's a list of 20 items. Pause the video, read them out loud in order, then look away and try to write them all down. 
Okay, if you did that, you might have found something interesting about the words you remembered and the ones that you forgot. That is, your recall of the word depended on its position on the list. The primacy effect suggests the words at the start of the list were more likely to be remembered. And the reason for this is your brain had time to rehearse those words and put them into long-term memory. The recency effect suggests that the items at the end of the list should have been more likely to be remembered because those words were still in your short-term memory when you start to write them down. But the middle items should have been the least likely to be remembered as they were less likely to be rehearsed and put into long-term memory, and they would have been displaced in short-term memory with the more recent words. A researcher called Murdoch conducted a study similar to what we just did, aiming to investigate short-term memory stores and how the number of items on a list affects recall. Murdoch's method was to ask participants to listen to a word list and then record as many words as possible. Murdoch's results showed that both the primacy and the recency effect in recall Participants were more likely to recall words at the start or the end of a word list. So Murdoch concluded from these results that it showed evidence for both long-term and short-term memory stores. Let's evaluate Murdoch's study. Whenever we evaluate a study, there are a range of ways we can do it. And over the course of these videos, I'm going to show you lots of examples. But one way we can evaluate is to think about the advantages and disadvantages of how the research was carried out. So the methodology. Well, this was a laboratory study with an unusual task. So let's focus on that. Lab studies are good because you can carefully control the situation. That control means that you can reduce the chance of some other random factor being measured called extraneous variables. That is, instead of what you wanted to measure, the independent variable's effect on the dependent variable. If some of these research methods terms, like variables have you confused, don't worry, you'll get used to them and you can watch my research methods videos to get you up to speed. But lab studies can also be criticised. That high level of control can make it unlikely that the participants would behave as they would do in normal life. Positive then, lab studies use standardised procedures. That's an advantage as it means other researchers can carry out Murdoch's study, known as a replication, and see if the results are the same. If so, it's reliable. Murdoch's task, however, was artificial. Very rarely in our day-to-day -day lives do we need to remember a long, random list of words. So Murdoch's findings might not really apply to how people use memory in day-to-day -day life. We can also give an evaluation of how the research could be applied. So for this study, we can suggest that the knowledge gained by Murdoch can be used in schools to help teachers design activities for their classes. Knowing that information at the start and end of lists are more likely to be remembered, you could put the less important information right in the middle. Okay, now we've covered the content. Now you need to be able to use all that information to actually answer questions. So here are five questions I've made to test your skills. So pause the video, give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, I've put together an additional video showing you how to answer these questions properly. For everybody else, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video on memory, memory as an active process.